Perfect. Uh, so as a follow-on to last week's discussion of uh, DNS, this week we're going to talk about DHCP. For those of you who are curious, next week we are not going to talk about NTP. Um, so DHCP, DHCP is the uh, is the standard protocol used to get an IP address for a device that doesn't have one. Much like DNS, it's one of those things that mon runs, you know, probably billions of times per day, and no one thinks much about it until it breaks. So, DHCP is answers the question of I need an IP address. Um, Jay requested that I talk about how awesome it is to have everyone get statically assigned IP addresses. Um, and, you know, that sounds super great to just have the, the tech support, you know, desktop support people run around and assign an IP address statically and then follow you around to everywhere you go and every time you log into a VPN and, um, yeah, okay, so that's not working. It's job security. or the desktop support guys. Um, so DHCP, we're going to talk about version 4 first. Um, you get an IP address on a computer when it boots, or when it connects to a VPN, or whenever, whenever a new network interface is enabled on a computer. Um, and uh, DHCP version 4 has a very famous acronym. So what is the most important thing you need to remember about this process? It is, it is what happens when your computer locks. There we go, Dora. Yes, Dora. Dora is the most important thing about DHCP. If she was on this call, it would be awesome. Um, so Dora stands for Discover Offer Request Acknowledge. Uh, the client sends a request to the broadcast address because it doesn't have an address of its own. Uh, if they're super lucky and the DHCP server is on the same network as them, uh, it will respond to it. Most of the time, it's the DHCP server is not on the same network as the client. So that would be for those of you who have configured switches and you plug in that IP helper command. Uh, the IP helper command tells it where the DHCP server is. So that helper command sends a unicast off to the DHCP server. The DHCP server responds with a unicast back to the SVI, and then the SVI broadcasts that offer back to the client. Then the client does a couple verifications to make sure that it is happy with that address and responds with the request of, hey, that one that you used can I actually use it. And then you get an acknowledgement back that says, sure, mark it in the lease table. And then you have an address, and you can go out to the Internet, assuming you have a DNS server. So how do you get a DNS server? Well, you get a DNS server because Dora gave you an IP. Dora also needs to give you a lot of other information, like your subnet mask, your gateway information, your DNS server addresses, your lease validity time, and a whole lot of options. So for those of you who have uh, touched switches or routers and you've had to configure some of those exciting options like uh, the ones for uh, call manager, you know, Cisco call managers or Avaya option 179 where there's this string where you tell the Avaya phone all sorts of interesting information. Um, there are custom options, domain search search suffixes. Uh, there's a lot of information that can get passed back via DHCP, all of which, you know, again, when everything is working, happens under the covers. The clients never see it. They just know I turned my computer on and I can get to Google or, you know, Facebook. YouTube or any of those other sites that, you know, the, the, the users spend all their time on, which are not necessarily work-related. So DHCP addresses 
can also be static or reserved. Um, so those are entries on a on the DHCP server that would have information like the printer is always XYZ.50 in our network. And those are usually uh, handled by, via the MAC address. Um, however, you can also do exciting things, uh, especially in InfoBlox appliances where you can tell it to do DHCP fingerprinting, where based on the requested options and the MAC address, InfoBlox will dump it into the appropriate, uh, will dump it into the appropriate reserve pool for you because you can say like, hey, I want all of my HP printers to use this range of addresses and it matches them up because uh, you can actually learn a lot from a device just from how it requests an IP address. Um, DHCP inform messages are the snazzy little thing that does not fit into the DORA acronym and they're used by um, they're used by DHCP to request uh, additional information. So if you have a static a static address that's configured on your computer, uh, but you don't have a search suffix string or uh, you're missing some information, uh, the client can send out a DHCP inform and it will then pull that information back from the DHCP server. Uh, this is usually how it gets uh, option information. Uh, the caveat there of may not behave as expected in Windows computers is because for a long time Windows computers did not support a thing called option 119 and as of Windows 10 version 1803 they do. So um, as a snazzy trick if you're at a customer site and you hear people complaining that their Windows 10 computer suddenly doesn't let them look up things properly by short name, their Windows 10 computer's probably overwriting their GPO with an option 119 from DHCP. Um, and that will only make sense if you ever run into that bug. Uh, what, what version of, uh, what build of uh, Windows 10 again? Windows 10 version 1803. It now optionally supports option. Okay. It now optionally supports DHCP option 119. The problem is DHCP option 119 has a pesky tendency to overwrite domain search suffixes that are pushed out by the GPO. So um, you have your anyway. Back to your address. So you've got all the information you need. Uh, how long do you keep it? Well, you keep it based on your lease validity time. Uh, the default in DHCP is 12 hours, and in DHCP version 4, you have a T1 and a T2 timer at T1, so approximately six hours in by default. Uh, your client will send a unicast request to the DHCP server saying, hey, can I keep this renew Can I keep this address? And uh, if the server doesn't have some other use for it or something strange is not happening, it will get an act back that says, yes, you may keep your address. If for some reason um, that communication doesn't happen, it waits until 87.5 hours, which I didn't do off the top of my head for what that breaks down to from a 12-hour default, but it tries the same thing. If it doesn't get a response back at the 87.5 range, it will start over with DORA again um, when it gets to the lease expiration. And that's DHCPv4, but we have DHCPv6 out there. So now, in the words of Monty Python, for something completely different. Any questions on DHCPv4? Nothing no. Here. There's no snoring. That's great. Um, so DHCP version 6 is based for an IPv6, and the premise of IPv6 is uh, a lot of the things that we deal with on a daily basis in IPv4 are included in IPv6. 
um, things like IPSEC or DHCP or things like that are just natively included in the protocol. Um, so most IPv6 hosts will run out and use stateless auto ad address auto configuration or neighbor D or uh, the neighbor discovery protocol or ICMPv6 to get an address. Um, I'm not going to dig into those right now. Uh, just know that that's how it works, and you end up with a link local address pointed to a link local gateway. Um, and in some cases, this gets you what you need, but not always. So um, the acronym for DHCP version 6 is SAR. I went looking for SAR, but I could not find any cute pictures. So the only thing I could find was soccer players. So um, You could have used Sarkis. I could have used Sarkis, but um, he doesn't have enough R's in his name. SAR actually evidently is a common is a common uh, uh, common uh, family name among um, several mem several leagues within the uh, African Bundesliga or whatever it's called. Sorry, not a big soccer fan. Uh, anyway, solicit, advertise, request, reply is what you're doing here. It generally follows the same process, however. There is no broadcast in IPv6, so you start with a multicast from your link local address. Um, the advertisory from the server comes back with a, here's the information you want, and then it goes to a request and reply. Um, so what exactly does SAR get me? Because I have a link local address. Uh, the two big things it gets you are DHCP options. Um, yes, because uh, just because you have a link local address doesn't necessarily mean that that link local address provides you with anything useful like, say, a DNS v6 server. Um, it also provides you with an IP allocation to your corporate network. Uh, link local and auto provision addresses are usually not they're usually not allowed by ISPs. They usually get blocked somewhere. Um, and if they don't get blocked somewhere, um, your security guys are probably not doing their job because, um, yeah, if uh, I can reach your link local address uh, from somewhere outside your security zone, uh, every single vulnerability that's on your computer I now have access to and I'm probably bypassing a firewall to get there. So. Um, and the item in italics is not a joke. Been there, done that, seen it firsthand. Um, not pretty. So DHCP version 6 is uh, a way to get a direct IP allocation on the corporate network. Uh, so you're actually subject to uh, you're actually subject to the uh, you know rules of various security requirements. Uh, in DHCP version 6, you can also have uh, static and reserved addresses, which would have to be assigned by DHCP by a DHCP server because um, your link local gateway that you're using for link local is not going to have the information about that unless it is your DHCP server. Um, DHCP version 6 also has timers. Um, theirs are caveated, though. Uh, they have a T1 and a T2 timer. Uh, how those timers work is different. One is a request and renew, and one is a rebind and renew. And unlike DHCP v4, they're separate timers. Um, if you want to really screw with a lab environment sometime, uh, set yourself up a DHCP version 6 environment, get yourself about 10 hosts, and set your T2 timer lower than your T1, and watch what happens. Um, take some packet captures. Let me know what you think. It's kind of cool. Um, if, you know, self-inflicted DHCP um, uh, multicast storms is your idea of cool, it's kind of cool. Um, and that is uh, the super brief version of DHCP v6. If you're at all curious about it and want to learn more, you can ping me. 
you can refer to the mighty various resources out there on the internet to pick up more things. And more importantly, um, I've given someone the opportunity to jump up and want to learn more about stateless auto address auto configuration and neighbor discovery in ICMPv6 and um, volunteer to do one of these exciting tech talks. Jay would love that. Trust me, he would. He has no idea how IPv6 works, so anything we can do to educate Jay is a great idea. And on that happy note, um, any questions? So, um, you know, you worked at at uh, a company uh, in your past life here that had uh, like, like solutions around that. There. Uh, um, what what what's a what's a cheap uh, what's I mean if you, let's say if you wanted to do something that was going to be dependent on DHCP like um, like um, auto deploy for VMware right like it, it it depends on DHCP to to actually boot up uh, hosts and 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 provide IPs and and so on and so forth here and um, obviously you have to have some kind of uh, something that's pretty um, robust. What, what's do you have a do you have a solution out there um, that could that doesn't cost an arm and a leg, but that would provide um, something for a customer? Uh, and like a, a something with high availability, server. right? Sure. Do, do you do you? Uh, that was always it's always one thing that I deployed a few auto deploy uh solutions here for VMware and and it, it's always like the the customer finds out, oh, everything is dependent on DHCP and and DNS. And that means I have to have something pretty darn you know, robust to, to be able to you know, ha have a have a data center outage and still have access to to that as a first level of services, you know, for the data center. Yes. So anyway, if you want to go I think Russell, go cheap. Russell's working on a solution for the Port of Portland that seems somewhat robust. So so oh, really? if you want to go super cheap, um I, I'm I'm curious in learning what Russell's doing, but um my my definition of super cheap and robust is uh, ISC DHCP, ISC being the Internet Services Consortium that's responsible for a whole lot of the Internet. Uh, if you've never looked at exactly what they do, um, definitely take some time to look at it. But ISC DHCP, you can literally download their server. Um, and they have a published standard that is used for DHCP failover. Uh, so basically you can just run this on a pair of Linux boxes. You can literally do this in two different data centers as a shared failover box. Uh, you point your SVI gateway at both of them and you actually have load balanced, highly redundant DHCP services. Um, I mean, InfoBlox has a really amazing solution they cost a little bit more than download it and set it up yourself. But there's okay. your DHCP and, failover. Okay, cool. And it doesn't cost you a Windows license. It doesn't cost you an InfoBlox license. It costs you uh, reading through the documentation and building yourself a pair of Linux servers. All right. But, uh, great, great question. And I could have gone into DHCP failover, but uh, I failed. So we'll save that for another trip. Is there any, Brad? Is there any interaction between auto addressing with V6 and DHCP with V6? Is there any uh, in between? Yeah. There are some extensions for 
IPv6 that will provide DHCP like feature DHCP v6 like features. Um, most of them are in pre most of the ones that I've seen that seem promising are in a kind of a pre pre draft RFC state. Um, and a lot of DHCP servers nowadays provide or support and give you what you need for DHCP v6. So uh, I mean between like classic DHCP for v4 like what we're used to where it's like a stateful DHCP service and auto addressing which has no DHCP service whatsoever. Is there um, something other than that or in the middle? Well that's where because because what you're talking about is stateless auto addressing um, in the middle uh, the middle ground between those two would be uh, the neighbor discovery protocol and the ICMP v6 extensions uh, that will go out and pull some of that information back. So basically, to, to get those to work, it's much like my DHCP. You um, start with a auto address, you get your uh, link local, and then you run neighbor discovery and ICMP v6 to pull um, to pull some of the information back without actually having to run a DHCP v6 server. Um, it's, so that gets you sort of there. Um, it, those features, unfortunately, lack some of the, have some of the same problems as the stateless auto address because they don't provide you necessarily with options you need. Uh, if you, for instance, um, there's no way for those services to provide a Cisco phone with its uh, call manager information, for instance, if your Cisco phones are running v6. So does that okay. answer your question in a not really way? <laughs> yep, it does. Do we have any other questions or comments? Okay, well, well thank you, Brad. Uh, once again, very interesting presentation. Um, I, I need welcome. your slide deck, so I'm going to send it to Dora. <laughs> oh, okay. I will email it to you and John right away. Okay, so John can post it in the usual spot. Well, again, guys, thanks a lot. Uh, next week, John's going to be doing an intro to AWS. Is that correct, John? I was going to do intro to AWS networking, um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know if we might want to just change that to, like, a generic AWS intro. I'll talk to you about it. Bye. All right. All right, perfect. All right, guys. Well, thanks a lot for attending again. Uh, we'll get this posted up in the next, you know, 24 to 48 hours once we get the recording, and uh, it'll be up on our site. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Brad. Thank you.